to destroy the works of the evil one and the kingdom of darkness with light and to rescue men from the law of sin this is the gospel of christ to proclaim good news unto the poor the gospel of christ spreading the soul-saving message of jesus and now ben bailey this is the gospel of christ the lord jesus will be revealed from heaven in flaming fire taking vengeance on those who do not know God and in those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. 2 Thessalonians 1, verses 6 and 7. Welcome to our study of the book of 2 Thessalonians. This book deals with some perversions that are going to happen, some inside the body of Christ and some from without, before and while the second coming of Christ is being discussed to the brethren in Thessalonica. The first perversion that Paul deals with is the old idea that when Jesus comes, it's going to be a happy day and everybody everywhere is going to be saved. Friend, that's just not true. The Bible clearly teaches that the coming of Christ will be a horrible day, will be a dreadful day, will be a day of vindication of God among ungodly people and those who think they've obeyed the gospel but have not. Notice the words of 2 Thessalonians chapter 1 verses 6 through 10. The Bible says, since it is a righteous thing with God to repay with tribulation or trouble those who trouble you and to give you who are troubled rest with us when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, taking vengeance on those who do not know God and on those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. These shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of His power when He comes in that day to be glorified in His saints and to be admired among all those who believe because our testimony among you was believed. This passage clearly teaches that everybody everywhere is not going to be saved. Everybody who looks up into heaven and says the name of Jesus is not going to be saved. Everybody who claims to be a child of God is not going to be saved. There are many who are going to be lost who thought they were right. The Bible clearly teaches that few are going to be saved. Listen to the words of Jesus in Matthew 7, verse 13 and 14. Jesus said, Enter by the narrow gate. Why? For wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leads to destruction, and many there are who go in by it. But narrow is the gate, and difficult or restricted is the way, and few there are. The way that leads to heaven, and few there are who find it. Do we really understand the biblical definition of few? In the days of Noah, few meant of the whole world's population, few meant eight souls. Friend, don't think to yourself that everybody's going to be saved and the day when Jesus comes back, it's going to be a happy day and we're all going to rejoice and shout and everybody's going to be saved. That's not the idea. It's going to be a day of retribution with God. God is going to repay with trouble those who have troubled you. That means that first and foremost, the ungodly, those who have been critics of Christianity, those who have persecuted the way, and those who have done evil are going to be repaid with trouble. It's going to be a troublesome day. For those who said there is no God, how they will be sad and sorrowful at that day. Every knee will bow and every tongue will confess at that moment that Jesus is the Christ to the glory of God the Father. Philippians 2 verses 9 through 11, to those who have persecuted Christianity, God is now going to persecute them. Romans 12 verses 17 through 21, God said to us, don't repay evil for evil, don't bring vengeance on yourself. I will repay, says the Lord. God is going to reap His vengeance on that day. Then we notice that the Lord is coming in a flaming fire to take vengeance on the ungodly. When Christ comes, it will also be a day of destruction. Matthew 24, verses 34 through 36, the world's going to end. 2 Peter 3, verses 10 through 12, similar language. The earth and all that's in it is going to be melted up, with, melted with a fervent heat. When Christ comes, it is going to be the end. The final curtain will fall and there'll be no more chances. And what's He coming in flaming fire for? 
to take vengeance on two types of people. Those who have not obeyed the gospel, those who do not know God, and those who have not obeyed the gospel of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Well, what two types are these? Those who do not know God are those who are not in a relationship with Him. To know God means that you are a child of God. You'll know the truth, and the truth will make you free, John 8, John 8 verse 32. And so first and foremost, he's talking about people who've never come to know God, who've never obeyed the gospel, who are not Christians. Friend, when the Lord comes, every person who's never been obedient to the gospel will, will perish, will be destroyed, not in the sense that they're annihilated, but will reap the wrath of God and will suffer eternal torment because of their bad choices in this life. God does get angry. Psalm 7 verse 11, God is angry with the wicked every day. And the day of the Lord's coming will be that day when He reaps vengeance on this ungodly, immoral world. But then there's the second class. Those who do not know God, those who are not His children, who have not obeyed the gospel, and those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I don't think in verse 7, in the second part, He's talking about people who've never been baptized, never obeyed the gospel, but rather, and the word is, continue to obey. Those who do not continue all their life to obey the gospel of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I believe there are two classes, those who have never obeyed the gospel and those who do not continually obey the gospel of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Obeying the gospel initially occurs when we become a Christian, but that's not the end of it. Our life must be a continual obedience, a life of continual obedience to the gospel of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Remember Romans 6 verse 4, after we've been baptized in obedience to the gospel, we must rise to walk in newness of life. We've been given a second chance, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17 through 21. If anyone's in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all has become new. There's no doubt that we've been given a second chance. But with that chance, we must every day arise and live faithful to the gospel of Jesus Christ. The sad thing is that too many people get the idea that when we obey the gospel, it's all over. We've done it. We've completed God's will. No, we haven't. We've just begun to do God's will in our life, and now we've got to follow through with that by being faithful unto death. Revelation 2 verse 10. We've got to follow through with it by giving our life to Christ every day. Do you realize that when you obey the gospel, you are no longer your own. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 6, verses 19 and 20, You are bought at a price, therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are His. Who do we belong to? We're no longer our own. Life is no longer about me. I was bought at a price. What price? The blood of Jesus Christ, the pardon of His blood, paid the atonement for my sin, or made pardon for my sin. And thus, the price was the blood of Jesus. Therefore, glorify God in your body and in your spirit, listen, which are His. To obey the gospel, I must be a living sacrifice every day. Romans 12, verse 1 and 2. I must have the mentality of the Apostle Paul. Paul said, I've been crucified with Christ. No longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave Himself for me. Being faithful to the gospel means I live a sacrificial life every day and when I do see myself in sin, that I make it right. Like Simon, I repent and pray to God that the evil thought of my heart might be forgiven me. And you notice from 2 Thessalonians 1, verses 8 through 10, it's a day when saints are looking forward to and admiring the Lord Jesus and His coming. We look forward to that day. It's not a day of sorrow. It's not a day of sadness for the children of God. It's a day of vindication, no doubt about that. But it's also a wonderful day. It's the hope the child of God has in this life. Then in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, there is another perversion that must occur before Christ can come, and that is the man of sin must be revealed. In the scripture, in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, there are about 10 characteristics given of this man of sin. We want to identify those characteristics from scripture, and then we want to relate it to what God is talking about that, according to scripture, still exists until the coming of Christ. And so, what is this man of sin like? In verse 3, the Bible says, a falling away from the faith 
must occur first. And so a first characteristic, falling away must happen. The falling away is from the original pattern, Acts 2 verse 42, the apostles' doctrine, and it is a removal from that original teaching. This is an apostasy of the faith. In the New Testament time, there were several different falling aways. In the book of Acts, there is the falling away of Judaism. There were certain Jewish Christians who are now bringing in things of Moses like, uh, like circumcision, things of that nature, and they fell away from the faith by trying to add law of Moses to the law of Christ. Christ's law is sufficient. We don't need circumcision, Paul says in Galatians 5 verses 4 through 6. There's the falling away that occurred in the first century related to Gnosticism. The idea that we needed secret, special knowledge, and only a certain select few had that, and you had to get with them to get that truth. That was a falling away from the faith. That was not true. Are those the falling aways that are talked about in the book of 2 Thessalonians? No, they're not, because those don't exist up into the point of time today. That's going to be one of the characteristics that we see. Well, we ask the question then, was there another falling away? We turn our attention to 1 Timothy chapter 4, verses 1 through 5, and the Bible says, The Spirit expressly says in the latter times, Some will depart from the faith, teaching doctrines of demons, seducing others. And he says, here's what they'll teach. Forbidding to marry and to commanding to abstain from meats, which God created to be, re to be received with thanksgiving. Well, what is the falling away? It is a departure from the Spirit's Word. It is a departure from the original pattern. And here's what they were teaching. They were forbidding to marry and commanding to abstain from certain means. Well, what does that sound like? Something that still exists today? Sure does. It sounds like the papacy and the Roman Catholic Church. My friends, the man of sin is the papal order and the Roman Catholic Church, which was a departure from the original pattern. It was at work in the first century, for we know they were already some commanding or forbidding to marry, celibacy, priests can't marry, and forbidding to abstain from certain moods, like beats, like on Friday, as the Catholics did. And so there's the first characteristic. The second characteristic in 2 Thessalonians 2 is that this sinister force from a first century vantage point was yet to be revealed. It was in the works, it was, it was coming on, but it hadn't fully been revealed yet. The Catholic Church did not take its shape fully until the year 606 when Pope Boniface III started that. And so this was at work. Its seeds were there, but it was still a future item. It was yet to be revealed in its full sinister force as we see through history of the papacy and Roman Catholicism. A third characteristic is this persecuting power is designated as the man of sin because sin is predominant, its predominant quality. A man of sin, the son of perdition. That's the idea that sin, that perdition or destruction is its dominant quality. That's what it's bringing. It's, it's leading up to a life of sin for some. It's maybe promoting it. It's a quality that it doesn't really deal with. You know, in Catholicism, for sin, you pay a price and you pay penance and you can get someone out of a life of sin or even purgatory, they believe. And so this man of sin is something that promotes sin, not something that it tells people to abstain and do away with sin in that sense. Fourth characteristic, the man of sin opposes God and exalts himself against all that is genuinely sacred or holy. He opposes God. When the Pope, sits in the chair, ex cathedra, and he speaks. Do you know that he speaks for God? The Pope is the vicar of Christ. That is, he is Christ's replacement on earth. Lord God the Pope, some people call him Holy Father. There's a man who clearly opposes God and exalts himself against all that is holy or sacred. When someone has to bow down and kiss the ring of another man and call him Holy Father, my friend, that is clearly opposed to God and what's holy. How do we know that? Well, listen to what Jesus said. Matthew 23, verse 9, Jesus said, Call no man Father for one is your Father in heaven. Jesus wasn't talking about in a physical sense. Jesus was talking in a religious sense. Well, what about Peter? Some say Peter was the first pope. That's not true. In Acts chapter 10, Cornelius 
calls for Peter. Peter comes to him, and Cornelius is so overwhelmed that it looks like that a Jew, a man of God, would come to him that he falls down to worship him. And what's Peter say? Don't you like my hat? Here's my ring too. Won't you kiss it? No. Peter said, stand up. I myself am also a man. And so the papacy, the Roman papacy, the Pope, Catholicism is not from God. It opposes God and it exalts that which is really holy and true. Fifth characteristic, in some sense the man of sin will sit in the temple of God as God. When, again, when the Pope sits in the chair and he speaks ex cathedra, he is speaking in the place of God. Many people in their mind when they think of a place where God is, think of the Roman Catholic Church as the temple of God today. Friends, that's just not true. The temple of God is not made with hands. Acts chapter 7, verses 48 through 50. The temple of God is each one of us who are faithful to God. 1 Corinthians 6, verses 19 and 20. And the temple of God today is the church of the Lord Jesus Christ and her members individually one of another. 1 Timothy 3, 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 25 through 27. And so some sense this man of sin sits in the temple of God as God. If that's not the papacy, papacy, my friends, then I ask you, what is? A sixth characteristic identified in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 is that this man or this whatever it is deceives those who do not love the truth by the virtue of lying wonders and signs he causes. Think about the signs that you often hear related to Catholicism. I recently saw on television where some shadow had made what people deemed as a picture of the Virgin Mary and she was crying. Somebody bought a piece of toast off eBay that looked like the Virgin Mary for about $15,000. A sign. Here it is, a sign. Look at these signs. Look at all these things that are happening. Well, what signs? The signs in the Bible were not glimpses or vague images or things of that nature. Anybody, if you look at a cloud long enough, you can find something. If you look at a shadow long enough, you can get something out of that. We're not talking about vague glimpses or things of that nature that people think. In the Bible, signs were clearly identified, undeniable. Acts chapter 4, the critics had to say that a notable sign has been done. We can't deny it. But let's take them and beat them so they don't say it anymore. These are not the signs that you see occurring in Catholicism today. And so they do deceive people with lying signs and wonders. Number seven, the early stages of this apostasy were already at work in the early church. Verse 7 identifies that these stages, these signs, were, these things were already at work. Again, we clearly see that to be the case. 1 Timothy chapter 4, some were already teaching, commanding to abstain from certain meats and forbidding to marry. If you study just a little bit past the first century from church history, we learn that it had already been the case that one bishop had set himself up, or one elder departed from the faith, set himself up as the head bishop over several congregations. Now, that was happening then, although it was against the will of God. Acts 14, verse 23, there were to be elders in every city, and yet we see the seeds of it already at work in the New Testament, and you look just a little past that, and you can see the papacy beginning to occur. Number eight, in Paul's day, there was some influence that restrained this man of sin, something holding it back. Something had not completely allowed that to form and to come to fruition. There were many who were still remaining faithful. It was not the way God wanted it to be, that close to the New Testament age. It was being opposed and not allowing it to go. And so we understand that it was restrained at that time. Verse 9, the restraining force would eventually be taken out of the way or be gone. It was the case that such would be removed and then that would be allowed to occur more frequently, allowed to flow more smoothly. It may be the case that the Roman government was permitting that from taking place. When the Roman era, when those, when those uh, rulers, Caesars, who thought of themselves as gods were removed, the Council of Nicaea, Constantine come upon the scene, then that era of persecution, Roman dominance was moved and the papacy was allowed to flow more freely at that time. And finally, the tenth characteristic, the man of sin, though having roots in the ancient world, would endure in some form or another 
other until the end of time, till the coming of Christ. This is why it wouldn't be Judaism. This is why it wouldn't be Gnosticism. Whatever this man of sin is, he's going to exist and is going to be destroyed by the Lord himself. And thus Catholicism, that force which began in the first century, which when the Roman rulers and their view of themselves as deity were removed, when they allowed that to happen through the Roman government, Christ will one day come and destroy that as it still exists today. Friend, we say this because we have concern for your soul. Catholicism is not of God. It is the man of sin. It is the son of perdition. It is opposed to that which is true and holy and right. But then there is a third perversion in the book of 2 Thessalonians. And in chapter 3, we see this perversion deals with the fact that some thought Christ was coming back so soon that they just quit everything and gave up. Some think everybody's going to be saved. There's the perversion of the Son of Man. And then there's the perversion by Christians of just giving up and being lazy and not getting out and living faithful in every area of their life. Some evidently had quit their jobs. Paul said here, if a man won't work, he ought not to eat either. Some had given up and got lazy. And so Paul gives specific instructions for these people. How are they to deal with this problem? Notice 2 Thessalonians chapter 3. And I want you to look in verse 6. The scripture says in 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 6, We command you, brethren, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you withdraw from every brother who walks disorderly and not according to the tradition which he received from us. Paul saw this as a very serious matter. Look at the, the influence it's having in the world. If people see Christians who are supposed to be above the world, living worse than the world, being lazy and not getting out and doing what they should, well, what kind of effect will that have? And so Paul says, you've got to withdraw from them. You've got to let people know, look, this is not the way Christianity is. They're walking disorderly, and they're not in fellowship with God, and we're not in fellowship with them. Then in 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 11, Paul gives this instruction. Paul says, we hear that there are some who walk among you in a disorderly manner, not working at all, but are busybodies. Now those who are such, we command and exhort through our Lord Jesus that they work in quietness and eat their own bread. We've heard the report. Some of Christians who ought to be the hardest workers, Ecclesiastes 9.10, Colossians 3 verse 24, have actually quit working, have gotten lazy, and are being worse than the world. Verse Timothy 5 says, if a man won't take care of his own, he's worse than an infidel. These Christians were doing that because their hope of the second coming, they were confused about that, and they thought, what's the use in going to work tomorrow? The Lord might be coming any minute. And so they just gave up. And thus, Paul writes a final admonition in 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verses 14 and 15. How do you deal with someone who is walking disorderly, who won't obey the commands of God? How do you look at that person? How do you relate to them? Well, notice what Paul says in 2 Thessalonians 3, verses 14 and 15. If anyone does not obey our word in this epistle, note that person, do not keep company with him that he may be ashamed, yet do not count him as an enemy, but admonish him as a brother. You've got to note those people. Don't keep company with them. What do you mean by that, Paul? 1 Corinthians chapter 5 is a similar example. There was a man in the church in Corinth who had a disgusting sin, a heinous sin. He had his father's wife. And thus, the church thought that everything was okay. They didn't agree with the sin, but they thought, well, we're bigger than that. We can overlook it. And Paul says, no, you can't. You need to withdraw from that ungodly man. And verses 11 through 14 clearly teach, don't even eat with such a person. Don't keep company with them. Don't eat with them. You ostracize them from the fellowship of the church and God because they've already cut themselves off by living unfaithful. Now, does that mean we hate them? Does that mean every time we see them, we scowl at them and we say ugly things about them? Of course not. We admonish them. Don't count them as an enemy. Rather, we admonish them as a brother in Christ. Friend, withdraw fellowship and church discipline is God's way of bringing the lost back and it works. You know, 1 Corinthians chapter 5, Paul told them, you withdraw from that ungodly brother. You deliver such a one to Satan. They did that. And you open 2 Corinthians chapter 2. Here's what Paul now has to say. I urge you, reaffirm your love to him. That man whom they withdrew from took biblical precedent to do it, but they did follow God's commands. It worked, and they restored that man. And all, now Paul is having to say, you need to reaffirm your love to him, comfort him, forgive him. You bring him back in the fold. 
what some of the problems we're facing inside the body of Christ today. We're not willing to practice church discipline like we ought to. We would rather sit around the Thanksgiving or the Christmas table with ungodly members of the church who may be part of our family than to stand up and do what's difficult, to withdraw fellowship from those people. We have to follow through if we have any desire and care for their soul. And so there are three perversions mentioned in 2 Thessalonians. There's the perversion that when Christ comes back, everybody's going to be saved. That's not true. The Lord's coming to take vengeance on those who do not know God, those who are not Christians, and those who do not live faithful to the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. There is the perversion which began in the first century and still at work today, and that is the papacy, the Roman Catholic Church, which teaches that the Pope is God on earth and that you've got to go through them to get salvation. And then the third perversion, Christ is coming so soon we just need to quit and give up on life. Friend, we've got to be faithful all the days of our life. We ask you today, are you a New Testament Christian? Are you sure you're ready for the second coming of Christ. There's nothing restraining now. Christ could come at any time. We don't know when it'll be. Matthew 24, verses 34 through 36 says, No one knows the day or the hour. We don't know when it would be. Therefore, we've got to stay ready, get ready, and stay ready. We're asking you today, are you sure you're ready for the second coming of Christ? Have you obeyed the gospel? In Acts chapter 18, verse 8, the Bible says, Many of the Corinthians, hearing, believed, and were baptized. Have you heard the word of God? Romans 10, verse 17. Have you believed in Jesus for salvation? John chapter 3, verse 16. Have you repented of those things in your life that are not right? Luke chapter 13, verse 3. Have you confessed the name of Jesus before men? Romans 10, verse 10. Matthew 10, verse 32 and 33. And have you been baptized into Christ? Here's what's interesting. The Bible says... In Ephesians 1 verse 3, all spiritual blessings are in Christ. 2 Timothy chapter 2 verses 10 through 12 says salvation's in Christ. And so here we've got Christ where all spiritual blessings are, where salvation is. We're outside of Christ. How do we get in Him? Galatians 3.27 says this, As many of you as were baptized into Christ have clothed yourself with Christ. The only way in Scripture that you get into Christ is by baptism. And after we're baptized, we must walk in newness of life. We must be faithful unto death so that we can look forward to, so that we can have hope of the second coming. Friend, is the second coming something that motivates you or is it something that scares you? If your life's not ready, it's going to be a dreadful day. But if you are ready, what a wonderful day it'll be when Christ comes back to receive His own. You may have just joined our program and are wondering, what is the gospel of Christ? The gospel of Christ is an evangelistic work of the churches of Christ that reaches the whole world with the gospel through TV, radio, and internet. Our motto is to take the whole gospel to the whole world. We believe in having a book, chapter, and verse for everything we say and do. And unlike many religious groups today, we're concerned about lost souls, not your wallet. We encourage you to visit thegospelofchrist.com for a host of Bible study materials as well as audio and video copies of our lessons. If you would like to have a copy of today's lesson, please visit our website and fill out a media request form, or you can email us at mail at thegospelofchrist.com. Call us toll-free at 1-855-458-3905, or write to us at P.O. Box 788, McMinnville, Tennessee, 37111. This is the Gospel of Christ.